Today, we're going to walk through some strategies for building the best user interfaces for developers. Uh, we'll pay special attention to font choices and color schemes. Hmm, maybe this one's not the right slide for this group. OK, that one looks a little bit better. Um, my name's Ty, and I've been working on mobile developer products for many years now at big companies like Twitter and Uber. Uh, oftentimes, that has been for external facing customers like open source and consumers of my API. And other times, that's been for internal teams, uh, feature teams, um, as we build internal tools to help uh, many apps build up on those frameworks. Either way, uh, I'm going to walk you through some ways to think about building great developer products and uh, to help bridge the gap for those of you coming from a consumer world. Today, the content will be pretty high level in the beginning and broadly applicable to most types of developer tools that you would build and work on. And then I'll dig into many technical issues using some of our open source examples um, that we build at Uber. Uh, first things first, I want to establish a common vocabulary. We're used to talking about a great user experience in our applications as this umbrella term for all usability-focused initiatives. Um, it's a common ideal for developers and designers to align around for the customer. So for our topic, let me introduce you to developer experience, or DX for short. Um, this is a less known but critical way of talking about and communicating about building good user experience for developers. And this is often used in engineers that are externally facing or among DevRel roles in the industry. And this umbrella term describes the research and recommendations that I'll be giving you here today uh, to help all of us build more intuitive software interfaces. I'll be covering a few large categories that should give you some insight into how to think about this space. First, we'll discuss how to think about the product concerns for developers. Then we'll talk about what usability means for libraries, SDKs, and other tools. Uh, then we'll move on to more important quality standards that will impact your customer's customers or the end user. Um, then we'll cover some tips for guiding you through the release process. And finally, some ways to think about engaging with and supporting your community of developers. So let's begin with the first areas to think about when building a developer product the product ideation, customers, research, and process. Many of us have built apps for consumers before, uh, but building for developers requires a different approach. A good product abstracts the complexities to the expected level of adoption by your customer base. But when we're creating professional products, like developer tools, those abstractions may look quite different and may need more to explicitly account for your different types of users. You'll still strive for things like consistency, simplicity, and an intuitive user interface. But the expected mental overhead to your customer is different than on a consumer product where you may be accounting for demographics that have less, less technical expertise. Instead, your customers will be primarily focused on execution and results, and you should try to align your product goals to ensure their success. In short, your priority should be similar to consumer products, but executed differently, focusing more mostly on efficiency and accounting for a much higher mental threshold for your customer. In a more traditional consumer product world, uh, you may have a product lead that envis envisions an idea, and they do individual market research to understand the space and the scope of the problem. Uh, and then they lean on UX research and on design prototypes and engineering leads to flesh out the early scoping of the product. Once there's confidence and detail, the engineering team would, would build out the final product. In the standard world, where there's this expected abstraction between the developers and the end user, this product design and engineering lead's jobs is to literally bridge the customer expectations to the, engineering, to the requirements for the engineering team. While the developers here may not have or meet, need as much uh, context to the customer in general. In short, while it's not ideal, it's not a hard requirement that your developers have to have direct customer empathy as long as your product roles do. But it's quite a different dynamic when the customer is the developer, where a normal abstraction would be between the customer requirements and the product for the developers. Now the developers relate directly to the end user um, on the product that's being built. So why do we need product roles at all in this world if it's just engineers building for other engineers? Well, in my mind, there are two major driving factors that speak strongly to the need to have product abstractions in a developer tool product. The first is the need to focus on specific areas of impact. A developer who's context switching constantly between product strategy, market research, customer engagement, building the actual product, 
is going to get pulled really thin and will most likely get really frustrated and be less productive. While your developers will probably take a much stronger stance on the product side of this because they feel that uh, attachment to the customer and developer, um, it's still important to give them the ability to focus down and build the best tools for your business and to segment the responsibilities among the different roles properly. And the second reason is the cognitive bias called the expertise bias. The more expertise someone has, the harder it is to empathize with being new to that thing. Tim Van Dam once gave an excellent demonstration of the problem talking about the slope of a mountain, where a hiker at the beginning of the mountain um, would seem that it was unreachable to get to the very top. And at the top of the mountain, it doesn't seem like it was so hard after all getting there. And you kind of forget the fear and the stress and, and everything else getting up the hill. And this can be a large constraint on the design for developer tools. This one is much less apparent than the first issue, but in my mind, it can be significantly worse. As people grow closer to the product through continued work on it, it's harder for them to put themselves in the shoes of someone totally new to it without any experience. And while this isn't exclusively true to developer products, thus why UX research on new user onboarding is a common process, I think it's easy to be a more prominent problem when developers are building for other developers. They'll more often take product interest and be involved in that process at an earlier stage, but this needs to be accounted for. So there's this very hard, find, hard to find balance between empowering your power users and building the railing to onboard new users here, developers, as they may have varying levels of domain experience. When building tools, engineers have this strong tendency to project themselves and their own experience and their own knowledge on that end customer. And this quickly adds pitfalls where things may seem really trivial to them because they have all this context, but it would seem overly complex to a new customer. So what is product's role in developer tooling? Well, many product teams, developer product teams, either don't have product managers or they have a significantly reduced number of product managers per engineer over a consumer product. However, I think this is a mistake. And that to build a successful developer tool, you need to rely on the product role, albeit generally the product roles on these teams should be more technically minded, both from your product and your design, as they're going to have to be working outside of their own domain and they're going to have to build up customer empathy. So this is more often, I see more product folks in this role that came from a developer background or UX folks that came from a developer background to help with this. Remember that, human, that developers are humans too. And they want usability, they want good designs, they want to get emotional attachments to the tooling that they're using every day. So let's dig into ways to think about product design for developer tools. An interesting framework to think about solving problems for your customers, uh, including developer customers, is called the jobs to be done framework. Uh, this was originally introduced to me by uh, PY, who's giving a talk here later today when they introduced it at Square. Um, this framework was designed by Clayton Christensen and Scott Anthony, and it was published in the Harvard Business Review to address thinking about the overall job and secondary jobs that your customer is trying to accomplish, rather than a specific bounded business metric. This covers both the logical and the emotional aspects to their choices. A job here is just shorthand for the customer's real goal. So if you dig into this process, one of the first examples given in their white paper is this interesting study on a fast food restaurant. This fast food restaurant wanted to start, they wanted to sell more milkshakes. And they, when they started researching, they realized that their customers were buying most of the milkshakes in the morning. So they started digging in and they found that the customer, and using this framework, they found that the customers were buying these to entertain them on long commutes where they were driving. They wanted something in their hands, something to do. They you know, were driving 30 to 40 minutes at a time. And so they were buying milkshakes as a form of entertainment in the morning on their commute. So in this case, Using this framework, the competitors to this fast food restaurant selling milkshakes weren't other fast food restaurants selling milkshakes. They were standard morning food, uh, maybe yogurt or smoothies or banana or things like that. And this allowed the company to make some adjustments that better fit the demographic that they were trying to sell to, like increasing the consistency of the milkshakes or reducing the straw size to increase throughput or introducing new flavors that were more breakfast oriented, like a coffee flavor or a banana flavor, things like that. And using this framework, they made a significant impact to their business metrics that they were trying to drive for, which was selling more milkshake in the AM. So let's look at crash reporting as an example developer product. What does the customer want? Do they want to measure more of their crashes? No, 
they want their product to be successful. They want stable software to give their, their developers trust in the product and give their engineers time to build business features as opposed to fixing stability issues. But this also immediately shows other areas for product innovation if we think about this. For example, if they're seeking more stable software, in what other ways could the developer tool provider think about granting that? What other verticals could they have? They could do things like automatic crash recovery, user feedback tooling, static analysis on buggy code. There's plenty of directions on reliability that this company could take, understanding that their end customers are focused on stability, not just measuring a metric. So we've been talking about the developer customer quite broadly, but that's quite an important thing to quantify when we're strategizing for developer products. There's quite a difference in a way a student may want to work with your tool and a senior engineer at Google, and quite a difference in the value that each one of them may bring as customers to your business. Each will have their own priorities and understanding of the broader framework that they're working within. And these differences in the customer should be identified and measured and then used within your product making uh, framework. By breaking up your customers into these logical groups for your product frameworks, you're able to clearly identify how a specific feature will target these different demographics and then how much value you can bring back to your company. So at Uber, we identified three major groupings when I was on our external API team for our third-party customers. We had uh, head developers, torso developers, and tail developers. The head would include large partners that would bring large value. They'd have experienced engineers and a huge amount of complexity on the integrations. This would be companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon. And they were usually managed relationships. You know, we had BD folks inside our company working with their BD folks, or we had partner engineers that'd go sit on site with them and help them with the integration. Um, and these were the smallest percentages of our customers by far, but brought huge, huge value uh, to, to our team and to the company. And then the torso would be your standard mid-sized startup. And these were often more self-serve customers. Um, they'd work through the standard support channels and the docs. They'd bring experienced engineers, but they'd have moderate value and lower support requirements. And these companies could eventually turn into head partners, but um, very rarely. And then the tail of the developers is the largest by far and the lowest value to the company. And this includes students and indie developers and small groups and just apps that don't have much adoption. And these are entirely self-serve, and they use the, the standard support channels and developer portals and docs, and don't really have any direct access to internal engineers for scalability reasons. So as we're thinking about new products, uh, understanding the effort to value spend is really important. In addition to grouping by demographic, uh, we create common personas to describe the way people work and what they care about. For example, a startup founder that wants to work, uh, that wants to quickly bootstrap up their, their, new their new startup idea. Or a student developer that wants their handheld as they learn and they're trying to like dig into everything. Or an enterprise developer that may require significant rigor as they really analyze a library to see if it'll work at their big company. Or a product manager who just needs a specific feature that a tool provides. All these folks would value different things within the tools, from ease of integration to flexibility to feature polish. And creating real personas around these customers ensure that we adhere to this framework to the actual matching jobs for our real customers in the wild. The Mozilla Foundation has a great set of public developer personas on their wiki um, that I'd really recommend going and taking a look at. I took some of these from that. Um, it's a lot more thorough than this example, and it's uh, a really good way to get started thinking about this. And that's linked at the bottom. Besides identifying the customer groups, uh, it's really important to get hands-on understanding with your uh, targeted engineers through research. Just like on consumer products, doing hands-on research with your consumers to identify some of the product concerns we've talked about here are crucial. When I was at Twitter, we ran, re regularly ran UX research with external developers. We'd bring them in and set them down and watch how they integrated the tools that I was working on, ask them questions about what they expected, um, and get feature requests from them. That insight was funneled back to the team and filtered through, and then out of that, new product and ideas and iterations and improvements came out of that. These sessions were streamed, which was interesting, so that developers could watch in and, and see um, expertise bias at play where they could say, oh, I thought that was really easy, and then watch someone struggle with integrating it for 45 minutes. At 
Uber, my team has done similar with internal customers. While we do have a lot of open source teams, uh, we, we're doing this primarily from our uh, platform team that builds tools and libraries for other teams to use. And so we've sat down with a lot of folks, done um, requirements gathering and product reviews and understanding their pain points. And that's helped a lot. Finally, collecting larger sets of data asynchronously will help drive a lot of your decision-making priorities as well. So we send out surveys and questions and analytics to gather more info. Uh, getting the right data from your customer ensures that you're solving the right problems. And a potentially hard area to think about when building product, for, uh, when building developer tools, is how to measure the success of that product. The three high-level goals that I recommend you strive for to move the needle on are developer productivity, developer happiness, and developer trust. Clearly, these are more nebulous, and tracking them can be difficult. It's not as easy to track as, say, um, you know, percentage of new user signups that completed successfully. But productivity here creates the business value. Happiness creates brand ambassadors, and trust creates loyalty. So measuring these through things like MPS, research, engagement, and developer analytics where possible will start to give you signals on these and allow you to adjust. Now you should be able to envision a developer tool that solves a real world job for a customer using input from the engineering experts on your team, understanding which segment of your group it would target, and therefore how much value it's gonna bring back to your company. Understand the needs and the, 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 needs and the complexities and who needs the speed of integration and how to measure your audience for feedback. And finally, some North Star goals to apply. So let's move on from the product ideas to making usable software. Usability is thrown around in the consumer products quite a bit, as we've talked about. And this app should make sense to the user, the text should be self-explanatory, design should be accessible, user flow should be simple and concise and intuitive, it should be the shortest possible path for a user to accomplish what they need. But what does that mean for a developer tool to be usable? It's very similar conceptually to the goals I just mentioned for consumer products, but the surface area is quite different. The surface area should be the concepts of your tool that the developer interacts with directly. Developers are just people, and they prefer usable and well-designed tools too. And this increases their happiness in their workspace. However, as we talk about different customer personas, it's important to understand how to make it usable for each different group. Usability in your tool and APIs can make or break the developer experience. And it's a serious endeavor when improving our developer surface area. So let's get into some priorities to think about when we're trying to make APIs that are easy to use and hard to misuse. For these examples, we'll be working with one of the open source libraries built by my team at Uber called Autodispose. It's a tool for managing RxJava subscriptions automatically to prevent linking them or having lifecycle conflicts. And I won't be giving a full overview of this tool today. I'd recommend looking at the, uh, the, the GitHub repo, which is linked at the bottom of all of these. But instead, I'm going to be picking and choosing certain APIs that I find to demonstrate the different qualities that I want to talk about. And then we'll talk through those, those qualities. It's important to consider how fast the developer can onboard your tool into their application. You should strive to allow integration with minimal boilerplate or configuration in minutes, and be able to show value to them right away. This can, be, this can vary a lot from a small library that's used on demand with a single method call, like an image loading library, to an analytics library that requires initialization at the beginning of your app lifecycle, event recording and recording, reporting back to a backend server. Here's an example taken from our auto-disposed library, which manages the RxJava subscriptions, so you don't have to worry about tracking unsubscribes yourself. Add the dependency to your Gradle file, and then just one method call in an Rx chain will integrate and perform all the required behavior for the subscription. And it couldn't be much simpler. So the APIs provided should also be simple and concise. The more boilerplate ceremony or reading is required by the developer to use the API, the more likely they are to use it incorrectly. Google recently sanctioned Kotlin as an official language for Android, as we all know. And while the community momentum existed long prior to that happening, one of the big reasons that Google pushed on that, in addition to everything they've talked about, has been the conciseness and the ease of access for new engineers. Now, the primary API for Autodispose is both simple and concise. And the API directly expresses that it's converting the chain into an auto-disposable chain. The API should be self-explanatory and intuitive. A developer should be able to understand what's going to happen without any big surprises by looking at the name of a class and a method. They shouldn't require certain ceremony to use it successfully. 
the way it works should be clearly understood from the developer without having to really dig in or retrain behavior that would have been expected from using previous tools that they were comfortable with. Here I show you a vanilla RxJava subscription at the top, where you need to manage your subscriptions and your unsubscribe in a destroy event to prevent leaking, versus auto-dispose, where the ceremony is taken away from the end developer, and it's much less prone to having an error, and it's much more intuitive for the end user. Your tools should be both consistent with the platform, best practices, as well as within the APIs of the tool itself. So on Android, for example, distribute open source code, deploy a binary to Maven Central or JSONer, use the Android frameworks and patterns, uh, just like a design language exists for each platform so the user doesn't have to relearn the paradigms between each app. Libraries and tools in, uh, in a domain should have a similar adherence so that developers aren't having to retrain these patterns. The APIs should also be consistent with each other. So use similar wording and tense so that you don't have to teach people different teach different concepts to your customers. For example, auto-dispose needs to be consistent within its own APIs, within the Rx Java patterns for observables, with Java's patterns, with Android's patterns, and with Kotlin's patterns. <laughs> so here in our uh, scope handler interface for converting different types of observables, we can see the consistency in the naming style of the APIs. Alignment with the Rx Java types, as well as integration with error prone via the check return value to enforce behavior on the Java and on the Android side. You should be thinking about composition in your public interfaces to avoid leaking implementation details and to guarantee the quality of the end product. For composition and auto-dispose, we ensure that all public calls expose interfaces to the developers and avoids having direct classes that are exposed. This helps us, the maintainers, ensure backwards compatibility with the API when we update. And it helps the developer in testing, and it ensures otherwise edge, case related, uh, edge cases that relate to interacting with non-public classes or the underlying RxJava classes can be avoided where possible. In the example here, uh, I'm showing a subscriber proxy for an observable. You may have seen these returned from the previous slide scoping logic. This pro proxy wraps the RxJava observable subscriber methods so that the end user doesn't interact with them directly. Now, composition helps to increase the resiliency of your APIs, but there's other ways as well. And in general, your APIs should be resilient, defensive, and safe to use. For example, if a method takes an object parameter, it should either be immutable, a primitive, or should make a copy or prevent the user from mutating or causing race conditions. Data classes and configuration-rich objects should use builders to ensure that they are in a valid state prior to use. The APIs themselves should appropriately hold on to weak references and lifecycle-based Android components to keep from leaking, uh, and be intelligent about not returning results during exit scenarios. It should not be easy for a developer to do something incorrect with a well-designed API. In this primary method of auto-dispose, we're proxying the subscribe method so the developer never deals with that underlying class. In addition to having resilient APIs, and libraries, you should consider where proper flexibility and extension would benefit your customers and allow different customer personas to utilize the product to their liking. This adheres to the open-closed principle, open for extension, closed for mutation. It's unlikely that you're going to cover every use case that your developers may want. So by having opinionated extension points, combined with a mindset around how you compose these into different building blocks for your customers, you can enable developer to build and extend and cover their own use case as a opposed to maybe forking your library or finding a competitor that does something that you don't. For example, in Autodispose, we have a number of extension points, including your own custom lifecycle events. You provide your own implementation to use for, to signal unsubscriptions based on your app's own creation and termination signals. There are many approaches to extensibility that could be useful, ranging from creating separate adapter packages to integrate your library against commonly used third-party libraries, to providing open classes for extension, to allowing custom code to be executed within your library's context. Another interesting example is one of our separate packages for interacting with many popular frameworks and libraries and giving Autodispose first-class support there, including Android, architecture components, Kotlin, Rx lifecycle, and more. The APIs should be testable by an end user. Developers should not test business logic of libraries, but they should be testing their integration with your library to make sure that it's behaving as expected. If the library is unable to be used in a testing environment without making real networking connections, that's an issue. Without 
Think about stubbing, mockability, and the ability to run in a pure JVM environment. Ensure that the customer is referencing an interface as opposed to the implementa implementation classes where possible. One approach is to distribute a separate testing artifact that includes tools needed to uh, use within unit test frameworks and interact with the tool. With Autodispose as our use case here, there's a couple useful properties for developers to test with. One, as we described, all the surface areas that interact with Autodispose are interfaces, which can allow proper stubbing. Two, and more interestingly here, we provide a test artifact package that, is, uh, that compiles only for test code to provide additional functionality. This provides a test lifecycle owner, which enables it to emit fake lifecycle events, which can be really useful in running with unit tests. And this would allow testing of lifecycles in RxJava, um, which could especially be useful to folks who are relying on custom lifecycle. In the example, we can easily verify that the onDestroy uh, has been called, that no more events are emitted after that. When things go wrong, the developer should be able to quickly see the issue at its source be able to troubleshoot and diagnose them. So give appropriate logging from your tool. More importantly, fail at the source when something bad is happening. It may be tempting to try to catch an error and to continue, but a developer diagnosing a weird state for a user is in a much more difficult position than interacting with a direct stack trace from the crash at its source. If your tool is completely optional and is crashing, you may choose to, grace, to gracefully degrade in a production environment, but that complexity is rarely worth it. Distribute your binary without obfuscation so that the developer can cl see clear stack traces and they can step into issues when they need to. In Autodispose, we have a plugin system modeled after RxJavas, so it can customize the behavior of the library. For example, you could set your own handler for lifecycle issues. Uh, for more controlled environments, we allow it to be locked down so that the configuration can only be done initially, and if anyone tries to change it after, it's gonna throw an exception. This behavior is more easily diagnosed than maybe a no-op where someone would expect different behavior because they updated a configuration later on and then they wondered why it wasn't working. You should have clear, concise documentation, both in the code for IDE auto-completion as well as broad examples and, expl uh, and explanations that take a, si a situational stance in your readme and additional doc pages. Javadoc should be used uh, and hosted and distributed alongside the binaries in Maven Central or JSONer. And this will be one of the first entry points for your developers, so be sure it guides them to the right spot. Sample code should also be available and distributed alongside the library. It should be concise and it should limit the complexity so that the users can clearly see how to integrate your tool without really trying to understand or be burned down with other concepts that you may be trying to use in the sample app. In the snippet taken from the auto-dispose sample, uh, the onCreate method is doing very little here besides the bare necessities to demonstrate the usage of the tool. The developer doesn't need to spend time here reading the code and understanding what's going on just to understand how to use it. And it should be clearly commented so the developer can really understand what's going on. The code itself should be production quality because users will copy and paste the sample code and it's going to end up in the wild. All right, that was quite a few code examples to demonstrate the API usability concepts that I wanted to talk about. And if you follow these, your customers are going to be off to a great start. But that's not all that's required to build good developer experience. So let's move on to talk about these quality-oriented properties that come after writing the code that you should be caring about as well. Besides usability with the software, where we focus on the direct effects of your tool on the developer, there's a lot of indirect quality issues that can really cause issues uh, for your developer and sometimes even affect their customers directly. So let's follow a principle of the healthcare professionals and do no harm to the customer's application. And this needs to be prioritized if you want to make a successful developer product. The last thing you would want is to create a worse experience for either the developer or, you know, even worse would be, you know, a crash for their, for their customer. So these quality focuses require aligning with the developer on what's important for them to consider in building their app um, and to really understand their development and support process. The benefit of aligning on these considerations with your developer customers is building trust with your customer. So let's dive into a few examples of how you would improve the quality and the side effects of what you put on the customer. In my mind, stability should be at the top of mind when working on the developer tool. Not only will a crash from an end user erode the trust with the developer, but it's much more timely to fix than a standard app bug. 
Here, let's consider a timeline for fixing an average issue in an SDK or library that's being consumed by a third-party application. Even if we discover the issue early on and we ship a fix, it could be months before that end developer picks this up, they update their version, and they get the fix. And it could be months further before they ship that version to the wild where their customers get it. And that doesn't even take into account that not all customers have auto-update turned on or are updating in a timely fashion. So it's possible for library bugs to live in the wild for months longer than standard application bugs. Similar to the importance of keeping stable products for the customer, libraries also need to do no harm when it comes to performance. Do everything possible to be as performant as possible. This means using appropriate threading, memory management. Try to take advantage of the existing resources where possible, like thread schedulers and file caches. Run profiling tools during development and test it on older devices. This is an area that can cause real frustration for end users. You'll often hear about app size being discussed as a constraint in reference to uh, emerging markets and uh, older devices, um, and primarily for Android itself. In my mind, though, it's, it's kind of an issue for both iOS and Android. Um, in addition to binary size, you have these constraints around traffic size over the network, cache sizes, memory size. On older versions of Android, even method count size is a problem when multi-dex can cause slowness in the app startup time. All these are going to impact the users negatively. And that will be disproportionate on these lower-end devices coming out of some of the emerging markets and you know, very, very poor networks in some of these countries. At Uber, we ship a light version of our writer app uh, to India and some countries in South America and the Middle East um, called Uber Lite. And this is a um, you know, very small version of the writer app. It targets staying in a single dex and under five megabytes on disk. So what does this have to do with a developer tool? Well, if your library is embedded in the app at runtime, and it, needs, it should be minimizing what kind of impact it has on size. When a developer decides that they need to prioritize trimming, that, hey, my app's too big, why is this so large? One of the first things they're going to do is they're going to do an audit of all their third-party libraries and say, why are these huge? What could I use that's smaller? Why is this pulling in these transitive dependencies? And you really don't want your tool to be on the chopping block during that. And unlimited data plans have kind of gone in and out of fashion around the world in many countries, and cellular chipsets still drain a significant amount of battery when they're on. In many of these emerging markets that I'm talking about, users still pay for their traffic by the kilobyte. And many even read the change logs in apps to see if an update has things that they want in it before they do the update. These are all reasons that you should prioritize batching requests and avoiding keeping the chipset active or waiting states, um, being conservative with what needs to be sent at all, and using protocols that take advantage of compression over the wire, things like gzip or protobuf or thrift. Here's a fun example of a, a guy I found on uh, Reddit who uh, had a $500 phone bill when Google Plus went wild in the background and tried to sync a bunch of stuff and ate 20 gigs of data. Another area where it's really easy to accidentally bring some bad side effects into your app um, or on your end users is choosing to use third-party dependencies. And so those get pulled into the app transitively, and then those third-party libraries are pulling in other transitive dependencies, and so on and so on. And it's not always feasible to avoid using third-party dependencies, even when you're building you know, your own framework or library. But unlike app development, I think you should be a lot more conservative when choosing to pull these in. Not only are they going to add size to the app for the developer, but it's possible for you to introduce things like Gradle dependency conflicts, where they're using a version of it, and you're trying to use a different version of that in a transitive dependency, and you have a conflict for the version, and it resolves to the latest, and then there might be a runtime crash. Um, and this could, if this isn't a commonly tested flow for the developer, that might get shipped to the wild and crash on end customers. So if you keep these overall quality metrics in mind, I think it'll go a long way toward building developer trust. After ensuring the usability and the quality of your tooling, defining a consistent release process that the developers can trust is really important. As we discussed, use the best practices for your platform here. So on Android, deploy a release to GitHub or GitLab, um, up to you know, deploy your binaries to Maven Central or JSONer. Integrate against public CI systems like Travis or Circle CI to maintain code quality. Let's dig into some specific concerns around the release process to ensure that you keep the developer trust high while you are able to ship quickly. To maintain developer trust, you need to be consistent and communicative with the updates to your tool. 
Semantic version is the idea that the major version is reserved for API and compatibility changes. The minor version is used for features, and the patch version is used to indicate bug fixes. And a developer should be able to trust that their work hours are going to concentrate on solving their business problems, not reacting to a third-party library forcing a migration down their throat and pausing other work streams. So be cautious when changing the API to avoid thrashing your customers. Secondly, developers won't always update the latest version of your library. Over-communicate what's required to get them to understand what the benefits or the fixes are that, are that you've put out in it and what they should care about. Make it clear to the developer what has changed in the new version. Since most don't automatically update to the latest master, and they watch instead for what might be a relevant bug fix or a feature that they're looking for. So make this explicit and link it in uh, the GitHub issues per version so it's easy to find. Inevitably, you're going to need to refactor or remove code, and I recommend you pay special attention to your thinking around uh, deprecation in general. First, before any work begins, always be thoughtful about adding any new APIs to begin with, as you're going to be supporting them for as long as possible. Uh, an API is like a baby. They're fun to make, but they take 18 years to support. Follow the guidelines we discussed for semantic versioning, so the developer knows when there is an API incompatible change, when they do that update, that they're going to be forced to make some changes. Mark your methods or functionality as deprecated as early as possible, and clearly define what the alternative should be, what they should be migrating to. Um, never just remove code without giving your customers any notice. Make sure you communicate with a clear timeline or, or version for your customer on when they can expect that functionality to be removed. Use multiple communication channels, like your blog, email list, developer docs, Twitter. Repeat this information more than once. Make sure people really understand this. As much as you do this, people are still going to be surprised when you remove code, even though you've been harping on it being removed for six months. And lastly, often you'll need to pair a feature or a desirable change with the deprecation to help incentivize updates off that version. This is kind of pairing the, the carrot with the stick, as the old idiom goes. This photo is a cake from my, from my team at Uber when we finished deprecating the legacy DI graph in the iOS monorepo. This was many hundreds of thousands of lines of code that we removed across many apps in a multi-million line uh, monorepo for Swift. The cake itself was a nice celebratory moment after five months. It was chocolate raspberry, and it was delicious. Um, I think it's a good, um, it, it's indicative of celebrating those small wins, even when it's deleting code and deprecations. With Kotlin, you can go one step further by making use of the replace with parameter in the deprecated annotation. IntelliJ will ask to quick fix this for the user and even give them the option to do it for the entire project, simplifying the migration. If you use error prone or lint, you can similarly use auto fixes and things that will allow IntelliJ to pick up hot, uh, quick fixes from that. This example is taken from one of Autodispose's deprecated methods. Lastly, for a, very, for, for a very successful project, it becomes really hard to scale a team's resources up to account for the extra scope needed for a large amount of, of inbounds and public contributions and just managing a large community. One way to address this is by building up the external community of contributors and helpers and maintainers as early as possible. Engage on the standard platforms directly, like Slack, like Stack Overflow, or Slack channel, GitHub, wherever people are engaging about this. Praise and reward helpful external folks through thoughtful words or gifts. Um, strive to drive your loyal customers to become ambassadors that will help others as well. Not only will this reduce the overhead on your core team or your company, but it'll help create a healthier overall project. Uh, Jeremy Mice has a great talk from DroidCon London last year or the year before on building open source communities where he kind of walks through a lot of this and the different life cycle of communities that I'd recommend, and it's linked here at the bottom of the slide. I want to emphasize having a clearly defined support system. Set clear SLA expectations for your customers and keep the lines of communication as open as possible to constantly be getting the right kind of feedback from your developers to fix and improve your developer product. It's common for teams to put out products with the intention to maintain it, and then as time goes on and priorities change or reorgs happen or people leave, products rot in the wild. At Uber, like most big companies, certain projects struggle with this as well. But it's something we're trying to address through more stringently defined internal ownership and being more thoughtful about this from the beginning. This is an actual example, uh, anonymized, taken from one of our projects um, to just kind of indicate the frustration that this can sometimes have. 
And keep an eye out for this in your project, because silence and issue rot signal to others that this project isn't well supported or maintained. And when they're considering adopting your library versus another, this is a good data signal to avoid your library. Set your expectations for public contributors. Call out the expected process in a readme. Review PRs quickly and be as collaborative as possible. Defining your roadmap publicly, uh, if you can. If you're using GitHub, define the issues for the next version and propose the ideas in the public so that folks will feel more engaged and it'll help build a better project and a healthier community. And with that, we've had a very high level overview of some of the considerations to take into account when trying to build great products for developers. Some frameworks and tools to use when planning developer products, a dive into library and API usability, uh, an overview of some specific quality properties you should consider, some tips for having seamless releases, and some thoughts on how to engage your community of developers in a healthy way. So I hope this talk provides some pointers for you to think about designing a great developer experience. Please check out our open source projects. In addition to Autodispose, we maintain many other great libraries, and we're always looking to have more contributors. If this sort of work interests you, uh, my team is hiring. We have offices in the US and in Europe. Um, I'll be around to take questions after the talk, and thanks you for attending today. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, thanks for your talk. I have uh, one simple question. Sure. Uh, as developers, we know that we are difficult users. We have uh, very high expectations. That's right. And uh, we tend to use our first impressions as continuous impres impressions about the tool. Yep. So um, has you ever faced a problem when you have released a tool for a developer and uh, uh, it made uh, bad impressions for developers and how to recover from these first ba bad impressions to a good impression where developers will uh, use uh, that tool. Thanks. You bring up a great point and I would take it further to say that that's not exclusive to developers. That humans in general, this is very true for consumer products in general, base their ideas on a specific thing on the first impression. Um, this is why a lot of apps have very common, uh, a very common struggle in getting users past that new user onboarding. You know, Twitter is a great example of this as a consumer product where they get people to sign up and then they can't really figure out how to get them to engage early on and many of them drop off and then say, oh, I didn't get Twitter. And some people push through that and eventually become a power user and start engaging with that. When I was at Evernote, we had a very similar problem. So with developer tools, it's, it's the same thing. When someone looks at one of these and they say, oh, it doesn't fit my needs or oh, I don't like this or you know, whatever this thing is, they're going to move on. And so you're kind of left in two places. One is, is that, do they solve that need in another way? If so, they're probably not regularly going back and re-auditing their old decisions, which is a healthy way to think about this, right? If you're building for your business, if you're building these business features, you shouldn't be rethinking your choice on a specific library or a specific tool once a month and saying, oh, is it good enough now and I can adopt it? Is it good enough now and I can adopt it? Most people, when they pick a tool, they leave it at that version. So it's not until like a major change happens that requires it. So since they already have that opinion and it didn't meet their needs then, it's your job as the author of this tool that you want to be reconsidered to really overcome that first impression. And that's through engaging with the developer community. It's putting it in front of them. It's really demonstrating the new features or the changes that may have you know, caused this. Um, when I was working at Twitter on the uh, Fabric suite, um, one of the, the very like, early stages of integrating Crashlytics required using the IDE and the IDE plugin. And we got a lot of feedback from developers that like, hey, I don't want to use the IDE. I want to you know, just drop this in a Gradle dependency or whatever. This was like early when Gradle even coming out. And when I started there, that was something I pushed on as well within the company. This decision had already been made. And we eventually added all of the alternative power user paths for integrating that. But it still took a long period of time for many developers to come back and readdress that because of those first impressions. And that's where that over-communication and just time was needed to help get that into a better place. Yep. I think that's all the time we have, but I'll be around after, and um, I'm happy to chat and answer more questions. Thank you. You're welcome.